Missouri's basketball roster for next year is in an obvious state of flux right now. So let's break down that uncertainty, the best case, the worst case, and the medium case as well coming up right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. Thanks for making Locked on Mizzou your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day and last time I was with you all in front of this here microphone, well, I talked a lot about Jamarian Sharp and Caleb Love, the big guy from Western Kentucky, seven foot five, best shot blocker in the country last year. And of course, the former St. Louis area product, former North Carolina Tar Heel, who entered the transfer portal recently, Caleb Love. And well, last time, some of you may have thought I was a little bit hard on Caleb Love, possibly. Certainly, if you didn't listen to the show, that was probably the case. I was asking the, the teasing question, is he overrated? Is he being specifically overrated by Missouri fans? And I still think that, yeah, probably a little bit. But to be honest, I don't want to – I don't want, let's, let's be clear here. Here's what's important. Should the Tigers take Caleb Love? Would I be happy if he donned a Missouri basketball uniform? Yeah, absolutely. This offseason, I would welcome him with open arms because clearly the talent is very much there. I, I definitely – thought Caleb Love took too many shots at North Carolina. Simply put, that does that mean he's a an irredeemable ball hog? Well, I, I don't know about that. I'm not going to go quite that far. And I think if Dennis Gates wants him, I think it's obvious that Love is a guy who maybe have to change his game up just a tiny bit. But at the same time, Missouri also has a big hole on the wing right now in terms of just pure scoring. A guy like DeAndre Golston, who would often, when when plays broke down, you'd give him the ball, and you know it wasn't always the easiest shots in the world. But obviously, Golston had a knack for knocking down tough shots at times, and at times you're going to need that in basketball when your half court offense breaks down. Well, Love has got as much talent. If he comes to Missouri, he'll have as much talent as just about anybody who's put on a Missouri basketball uniform for the past few seasons. So you welcome that kind of talent with open arms. And it's not as though I've heard he's like a terrible person or like a locker room cancer or anything like that. I don't know what kind of person Caleb Love is. I have absolutely no idea. Just looking at it on paper, you'd like to see a guy who is a relatively inefficient jump shooter, maybe just scale that back a tiny bit. That was the crux of my criticism of Caleb Love. But once again, if Missouri can get him, I'll be applauding the move. That'd be a huge coup to get a guy of his talent in the transfer portal. No doubt about that. And of course, well, while Missouri, I think, reportedly feels good about its chances for Jamarian Sharp and for Caleb Love, well, I'd say maybe the biggest the biggest decision is up to Kobe Brown still at this point. And it may take him probably longer than those other two men by quite a by quite a significant margin to actually make that decision. And if I were Kobe Brown, I'm not really sure what I would do, to be honest with you. It's a really, really tough call. Honestly, as I sit here and think about it, though, even being the gigantic Missouri fan that I am, and I know that Kobe Brown has come to love Columbia and Missouri and all that good stuff, but hey, I, I'm a childhood Missouri guy. So even with that extreme bias, I think even I would probably go to the NBA if I were Kobe, just because from what everything I hear, he's a marginal sort of, you know, second round. Maybe somebody would give him a, two, a, a guaranteed money of some sort. Maybe they won't. I don't know. I think if I'm Kobe Brown, I've played four years of college basketball. I think it's just time to bet on myself at this point. I think it's time to, to move on and, and start the next part of my life. But again, as a Missouri fan, I want Kobe Brown back. And he has a lot of reasons to come back because this could be an 
excellent, excellent team next year. If indeed Sharp and Love are on board, well, best case scenario, how's this sound for a starting lineup? How about Jamarian Sharp, Kobe Brown, Caleb Love, Nick Honor, and I don't know, pick your wing, honestly. You want to go with John Tanjay? Great. Maybe Isaiah Mosley comes back. Again, we're talking best case scenario here. So yeah, Mosley. And you've still got Kurt Lewis, the one of the junior col- best players of junior college last year, a dynamite shooter. Aiden Shaw on the bench. We're talking eight deep already before we even get to any of the true freshmen. I'm a big Aiden Shaw believer. So that's a really, really good potential top eight there immediately. That's your best case scenario. But even in the medium case scenario, which I think is kind of interesting, let's say Missouri gets sharp and love, but Kobe Brown, well, sort of goes more with my instincts and goes to the NBA. Well, I think that's still a really, really interesting club. Obviously not not as much upside as they would have with the very versatile Kobe Brown. But what's interesting to me is that I think Missouri could actually play small very easily. And I mean that sort of ironically, too, with Jamarian Sharp. Because how do you play small when you have a seven foot four guy in the middle of the paint? Well, because I think with him, you could easily play four perimeter players with him. Because defensively, he he's just going to take care of so many problems in the middle of that paint. You don't really have to worry about having a traditional power forward, a guy who is the size of Kobe Brown or Noah Carter or whoever. And again, with Noah Carter, you can essentially play big and small at the same time because he's big enough to punish you on the inside and step outside and hit a three as well. So I just think that's all really, really interesting. And I just realized I didn't even bring up Noah Carter. I knew there was somebody important I was forgetting there. That actually makes a a rotation of nine incredibly interesting guys there with that best case roster. But again, even medium case, you just get sharp and love. Maybe Kobe moves on. I still think you're talking about easily a preseason top 25 type team. But if Kobe comes back, now we're talking, man, that team's going to get a tremendous amount of hype with the best case scenario of that roster there. You're talking top 10 or 15. I really mean that. But of course, Missouri is not the only team after Jamarian Sharp. Memphis is after his services. And well, Caleb Love certainly seems to be showing some interest toward Indiana as well. Again, Missouri feels good about their chances from what I've heard in both cases. But of course, there is a worst case scenario. So what happens If Missouri doesn't get either one of those players and Kobe Brown still decides to go to the NBA, none of those guys come back. Isaiah Mosley not back either. What does that roster look like? Well, let's talk about that. And it's not as bad as you might think, but let's definitely talk about that. But first, I want to tell you about Built Bar. Yes, Built Bar, March Madness. It's winding down just like the actual tournament and we know you have your favorite bar puff well now's the time to make it count go to builtmarchmadness.com to vote for your favorites you know i vote for anything and everything with coconut in it and if you want missouri to win the national title next year you know what you got to support your team support your bar or puff and you know what one lucky locked on listener is going to get a free box of built bar that's right in fact i misspoke there it's 50 lucky locked on listeners we'll get a free box of built when you vote on your favorite not only that the one special locked on fan here we go will win a 12 month subscription to built to have built's best bars or puffs delivered straight to your door and what makes them so good well 100 percent real chocolate high in protein, the whole deal. So run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. And you can vote every day in March and in April as well. So hop in and support your pick. If you've been following this podcast closely for the last few weeks, you know I'm a big fan of Aiden Shaw. I think he's going to have a breakout type campaign his sophomore season. That, that's just the gut feeling that I have about that young man. But I will say, if Missouri doesn't get Jamarian Sharp, well, and especially if Kobe Brown moves on to the to pro basketball as well, well, he better be ready next year. He being Aiden Shaw, because 
Otherwise, at this point in the transfer process, I, I don't know how many legitimate, good, serviceable big men are going to be on the market. I really don't. And I think, you know, again, when I'm talking about the worst case scenario here, well, we don't really know necessarily who's going to be available in the transfer portal going forward. You see new names popping up each and every day. I'm just talking about worst as in, okay, Missouri doesn't get love, they don't get sharp, and Kobe Brown moves on as well. So you're talking about then a starting lineup of Nick Honor, again, Kurt Lewis, the junior college player, John Tanjay, the the Colorado State, tra State transfer, Noah Carter, and I would say Aiden Shaw. Those are probably looking like your starters along with Sean East, the three freshmen, and then, you know, who knows, whatever transfer portal players you could possibly get there. And that type of lineup actually, yeah, that's probably a team I wouldn't necessarily expect to make the NCAA tournament. But again, transfer portal, how good is Shaw next year? I don't know. All I know is that team would probably be playing really fast, really wide open. It would certainly be exciting to watch. So it wouldn't be the end of the world even if you get the worst case scenario. And I, I really think the odds of all three of those events happening are, are really pretty low. So I wouldn't get nervous about it just yet if you're a Missouri fan. And you know what? Speaking of Isaiah Mosley, who I brought up earlier, it sure seems like Isaiah wants to be back at Mizzou right now. I'm not really sure what's going on with him at the moment, nor have I been sure the entire season. But one scenario that's been floated around the Missouri beat lately, especially by Gabe DeArmond over at PowerMizzou.com, is that Isaiah Mosley could potentially come back next season and not be on scholarship. And I got to say, I'm, I'm a little dubious of that. I, I'm not saying... I'm sure somebody is telling Gabe that. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not accusing him of lying. That's not the point here. The point is... I'm just wondering if maybe that person who is giving Gabe this information doesn't have all of their information, this source, because I'm just trying to think of a scenario in the history of college basketball where a guy was on scholarship for an entire season. In fact, well, for three years before that, too, at Missouri State, right, or two years at least at Missouri State before that, and then suddenly, oh, nope, he's not going to be on scholarship next season. Don't worry, though, he's, he's going to be on the team and presumably playing a lot, right? If Isaiah Mosley's on the team, I, I think he's there for a reason and going to be playing a lot more than he did last season. you got to assume that. So, I don't know. I'm just really dubious that the NCAA, which historically has been pretty, pretty on it in terms of if anybody's trying to actually skirt scholarship limits, that kind of thing, I realize that name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal – it just seems like all rules, it's just sort of, you know, it's a free-for-all at this point. And who knows what the future holds in terms of any types of regulation. Hey, I hear you there. I'm just wondering if maybe this actually is a line in the sand that maybe the NCAA won't want people to step over. In terms of, hey, Jackson Francois, see you later, buddy. Um, we've got another transfer we'd like to add, but we're just going to pay him some name, image, and likeness money, and don't worry about the scholarship. Because that's essentially what we're talking about here with the Mosley situation. I don't. That's the unsaid part of all this, because if there were no such thing as name, image, and likeness, I don't think anybody would be floating the idea of, oh, well, don't worry about it. He'll just, uh, he'll just walk on next year if he's on the team. I, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm completely wrong here. Maybe I'm completely overanalyzing it. And maybe that's what will happen next year. I don't know. I just find that hard to believe that the NCAA is just going to be cool with that. Because if they are, well, guess what? They've opened up a big old Pandora's box and suddenly walk-ons, guys like Jackson Francois, who are practice players essentially, well, they're going to be gone because you're going to have real guys who may get playing time on the team on your roster instead. That's what's going to happen if this is allowed to take place. Now, from a Missouri fan's perspective, yeah, for next year, I hope it happens because if Isaiah Mosley is on the team and is a big part of it, it doesn't count against the scholarship limit. Well, that's a massive competitive advantage for Missouri, so don't get me wrong, I hope it happens. And coming up, yes, we've talked a ton of basketball here lately for obvious reasons, but this is a Mizzou football show as well, so we got to talk about the gridiron and something's been in the back of my mind 
lately is that if Eli Drinkwitz and his new and his new offensive coordinator Kirby Moore, if they aren't implementing a short yardage strategy this season that we saw in the Super Bowl, well, frankly, I think they should both be fired immediately. So let's talk about that right after these quick words. Okay, maybe fired immediately it was a little strong, but it was a good tease, wasn't it? But in all seriousness, to me, if you watch the Super Bowl, as I'm sure about 100% of you did, you had to notice the push play by Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia Eagles that was absolutely and almost utterly unstoppable, not only in the Super Bowl, but for most of the, the NFL season as well, especially when Hurts was 100% healthy. Well, to me, if that's now that we've got an entire year, actually, Bill Barnwell t- tweeted this out recently, and I, and I couldn't agree more. It's something I've been thinking about for a while now. Now that coaches at all levels of football have had an entire season to process what they've just seen here, what the Philadelphia Eagles were doing. And by the way, there's been no rule change in pro or college football prohibiting pushing the ball carrier from behind. So guess what? On short yardage now, just get your big tight ends and receivers, whoever your strongest guys are, get your big quarterback and just push them forward. Because apparently that play is almost unstoppable. And the reason I started thinking of this actually is because of Anthony Richardson, the Florida quarterback. I I just, I found it hilarious this past weekend. He's like making headlines because he did a backflip at some point and wow, he throws the ball effortlessly 70 yards and all that good stuff. I, I just find the combine to be one of the more ridiculous things in the entire world. We're asking our quarterbacks to put on a gymnastics performance. Listen, we all know Anthony Richardson is going to look great at the Combine. There's no question he's got all that. It's all the other little intangible stuff that you wonder about for me. I'm just not a big Anthony Richardson believer, but at the same time, I got to admit, I wasn't a Jalen Hurts believer going into the NFL either. And boy, so far he's proven me wrong. My goodness, he was tremendous in the Super Bowl against my Chiefs this past February, obviously. So I'll definitely take a big time L on the Jalen Hurts evaluation there. So maybe Anthony Richardson will prove me ra- will prove me wrong, but at the same time, regardless, I ha- I do have to admit that dude is gonna if they do the push play with him. I mean, he's going to be unstoppable in short yardage. And that's not a small thing. If you're an absolute weapon like Cam Newton was back in the day in short yardage, I mean, the game's all about moving the chains and getting into the end zone. So what? what's more important than that? Not much. So to me, I just think if you're Eli Drinkwitz, if you're Kirby Moore, if you don't have some version of the push play in in your playbook for short yardage situation, for third and one, for fourth and one, I'm, I'm just not sure what you're doing. And really, this goes for everybody in football. If you're not practicing this this offseason, making this a big part of your offense, I think you're doing it wrong. But hey, thanks to all of you for doing it right and joining me here on Locked on Mizzou. For your first listen today and for your second listen, check out Locked on College Basketball. Got one game left, folks. Isaac Shade, Andy Patton, going to preview it for you, recap it tomorrow, everything you need to know about the game, recruiting, college basketball in general. That's Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. So until next time, I'm John Miller, and this has been Locked on Mizzou.